Ezekiel 47 describes four different types of Christians. Christians who are walking in the mud at the side of the river, ankle deep, and Christians who go to the extremity of walking knee deep, thigh deep, and then over their heads. Fantastic, isn't it? If we read that, I'll, I'll just share what these Christians do. He brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. <clears throat> and when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and he brought me through the waters and the waters came to my ankles. Glory to God. The waters came to my ankles. That's entry level <laughs> into the kingdom. Salvation level. You start, you come into the river of God. You become family with God. You end up at the river and you walk and you keep walking. And this man kept measuring 1,000 cubits. Every 1,000 cubits ended up at a different level and different angle with the water. The ankle deep, he measured 1,000 and I came to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me to the water, came up to my waist. And he measured another thousand, and it was a river that I couldn't cross. For the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. <coughs> Praise God. <coughs> Excuse me. He... Um, he brought me back to the bank of the river and when I returned there along the bank of the river there were very many trees on one side and the other. And he said to me, <coughs> this water flows down to the east region, goes down into the valley and it enters the sea. And when it reaches the sea, it wa its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they'll be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. I want to tell you something. This relates to the Holy Spirit in this river but it also relates to you. Every living thing that moves, whenever you go, this water flows into the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. It speaks of the depth of cleansing that God does in your life. It speaks of the depth of your walk with God. Most Christians wonder what their job is on earth. I want to tell you what your job is on earth. One simple word. Reconcile man to God. Reconcile man to God. Ricky, can you look up reconcile <coughs> in the Bible? The wall of reconciliation. Because our job, once we come to the Lord, is to lead others to the Lord. Once we come to God, we need to talk to others and share about Jesus. We need to tell them that because he forgave you your sin, he can forgive them theirs. Amen? Ephesians 2.16 says, That he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. This was Jesus' job. In Colossians, it says, and by him, in Colossians 1.20, he would reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in earth, in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting in Acts 7.26 and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, you brethren, why do you wrong one another? They were arguing. They were walking along and arguing. <clears throat> a bit typical of Christians. I've got three pages more in the book. I'll raise you Ephesians 6. It's like a game of poker sometimes. <laughs> Have you ever tried to bring someone to the kingdom by arguing biblically? It never works. It just causes an argument. I can remember, I can remember when Nice and I went to Israel. <coughs> I didn't want to go. But I can remember that we ended up in Israel and I promised her that I wouldn't work and that we were on holidays. And uh, we ended up in a kibbutz. In fact, it was the kibbutz where um, 
Golda Mia, she was one of the presidents of Israel, one of the first ones, where she uh, stayed and worked. And uh, we were in that kibbutz, and it was being run by an <coughs> ex Hasidic rabbi, a young man who'd studied the Torah, he was 54 years old at the time, been studying the Torah all his life, then found Christ. <laughs> he was ostracized by his people. You can't argue religion with religious people. You can't argue the word with religious Christians. You can't argue the word with worldly people who half know the word and you think you know it all. Self-righteousness stinks in God's eyes. <laughs> you know, the greatest sin that I think God has to forgive is, um, is um, self-righteousness. People thinking they've got it and they've got it right and it makes them stubborn when the truth comes along. But the truth is that God wants us to reconcile people to him. You've been reconciled, and you've been reconciled through forgiveness of your sins. <clears throat> when I come to these healing waters in Ezekiel, I see deep water Christians are people who've learned how to forgive. Deep water Christians are people who don't take on resentment. Deep water Christians don't bear grudges. Deep water Christians allow the Spirit of God to take them along the river, wherever it goes. And that river will meander and go so many different places. And God wants to make us deep water Christians. In the middle of this coronavirus, <clears throat> God's people are learning whether they're deep water or shallow water. <laughs> There's a lot of questioning of self at this time. The economy is stopped. People are dying. Probably not as many as what they tell us, but people are dying. And uh, the common flu has taken out just as many in this country in other years, most normal years. So. We're in a place at the moment where they're using this coronavirus to bring in laws and change times and seasons. And they're doing it quickly and they're not having the arguments in Parliament to do this. But deep water Christians don't trouble themselves with those things. They don't trouble themselves with what's happening. They find a place where they can talk to God, run into the closet, hide in him and get answers for what's happening. Get answers for other people. If someone's sick, they can pray for them and reconcile them back to God. If, they, if they're in trouble financially, they can put their hands in their pockets and help those people and reconcile them to God. There are many ways of re revealing Jesus to the world. But this book speaks to Christians more than it does to the world at the moment. This is how we grow in God, how we come to the place of growth. And ankle deep doesn't do it. Ankle deep muddies the water so that when people come to Christ, all they see is muddy water. Not good for drinking. Terrible, actually, for drinking. They need to be able to drink clear water, the truth of the word of God. <clears throat> Jesus spoke about that of the woman of the well. He said, draw me some water. She said, what are you doing at the well? You haven't even got anything to draw with. He says, if you knew who it was who's talking to you, he said that you would draw me water and I would give you living water and you would never thirst again. And this river represents that place. This river represents what God's saying to us today. Deep water Christians learn to forgive because forgiveness is the first thing that Christ died for us for. Deep water Christians forgive easily. Forgiveness is something that we have to go through continually. Forgiveness isn't just a one-off. <laughs> Forgiveness is something we have to live. Amen? I want to share stuff with you. I've just written some stuff down this morning. I want to be a deep water Christian. When we were in, when we were in uh, Israel, we found, we ministered to the head of that kibbutz whose father was dying, and his father was a rabbi. A Hasidic rabbi. Hasidic rabbis are known for their religiosity. 
Even the signs in the streets of Israel on Saturdays, when they're having a Sabbath, not allowed to do anything at all religiously. Even the signs show these Hasidic Jews with hats and curls coming out of their hats. And they stone people who drive through their neighbourhood <laughs> on the Sabbath. <laughs> Even today they do that. They're, that's religion to the utmost. So this rabbi was an ex-Hasidic Jew. His father was a Jew, a Hasidic Jew, a rabbi. And he was dying in the hospital and somehow we got to hear about it. And uh, he came up and he went, went off at me because I shared with them that if anybody could hear God at the time, had relationship with God, that they would be able to minister and see that man come out of hospital. And he came up to me, he was angry, he thought I was making fun of his dad while his dad was dying. They gave given that man two days to live. But we went there with a word of knowledge, released the man. God spoke to us something that was so deeply entrenched in that man's heart had to do with forgiveness <clears throat> a man who professed to know God and yet all his life had carried unforgiveness enough to cause the sickness that, had, that uh, was about to kill him I, didn't, I wasn't aware what the sickness was when I went and I'm glad I wasn't because it would have sucked the faith out of me <laughs> but I ended up speaking into his life and immediately he gave his heart to the Lord and immediately he forgave someone he had carried this unforgiveness for for years. He was 80 years old, this man, and when he was four he saw his parents get shot by Germans and he had to forgive those people. And, so, and I came and told him what his problem was. God spoke to me, said, this is what's happened to this man. This is what he's carried. And that word of knowledge opened up his eyes, opened up his understanding, and he forgave immediately. And he was immediately healed. Did you hear me? He was immediately healed. Forgiveness is such a key. Forgiveness is such a key. We need to be able to forgive. You know, when I look at bitter people, people with bitterness in their life, generally I can always relate it to a resentment that's blossomed into a full-blown unforgiveness spirit. So I want to speak to you about forgiveness today. While I've been sitting down, having some time through this um, having to be home, I've been looking at forgiveness. <coughs> And I started at the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer was there to enable us to examine ourselves on a daily base. See, forgiveness is a lifelong commitment. Every day you come to that place. Examine your own heart. You know, nothing would be worse than to think that you're saved or that you have fellowship with God. But if you've got any unforgiveness at all in your heart, you have cut yourself off from fellowship with God. This is not your salvation, but it's your fellowship with God that gets cut off. You know, as I, was, as I was questioning this, I had to question salvation. Do you want to know what salvation is? It's an unconditional thing. There is no condition in salvation. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. Simple as that. You believe on the, long, on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. Salvation is unconditional. But your fellowship with the Lord is conditional. Your fellowship with God is conditional. When we're justified before God, we are declared righteous. And that can only come by your faith. But anyone who transfers the trust that he or she had in their good works and instead trusts on what Jesus did on the cross is fully saved. God credits to them a perfect righteousness just because they believe on what his son has done for them. This is ours forever. Say, this is mine forever. This is mine forever. 
But fellowship with the Father on our way to heaven is conditional because we may temporarily lose fellowship with him and we come in and out of it. Anybody ever feel like that? You feel that one day you're okay with him, the next day you're not. That's based on your relationship with him, fellowship with him. Your salvation is a basic truth, unalterable, unchangeable. Praise God. We're declared righteous by faith. We're justified before God and our justification is also unconditional. But the anointing of the Holy Spirit is conditional. The anointing, the power of the Spirit in our lives may ebb and flow and the dove may come down for, uh, after a while and our standing before God because of the righteousness of Christ is put to our credit is permanent. We are righteous before God permanently. And we have something called confession. We confess our sins to God the Father and he cleanses us of all unrighteousness. It's a permanent condition and it's a permanent right as a child of the family of God. Isn't that wonderful? Our status in the family is unconditional. Once you come into the family, you are family. Once you're born again, you're born. <clears throat> when I was born in the world, that's it. I'd come out of the womb, there's no going back. <laughs> Amen? And it's no different spiritually. Our intimacy with Christ is conditional though. We're sons and daughters forever. We've been adopted into the family. Any doubt, just read Ephesians 1.5. Let's, let's read that and see what it says. <coughs> Ephesians 1.5. What's it say? It says, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We've been predestined to be adopted as sons. That's you and me. We're in the family. Say we're in the family. I got good news for all you crooks. You get a little set down, you open the books. <laughs> and then you'll be a blood-washed member of the family. <laughs> blood-washed. Family. Family member. We're in the family business now. We are secure in the family. is just as secure as Jesus himself is in the Trinity. Isn't that wonderful? I don't know about you, but this is good news to me. This cheers me up no end. That I'm in the family of Christ, unconditionally saved, justified before God, unconditionally, in the family, unconditionally. And my eternal destiny, whether I go to heaven or hell, is fixed. Once we're saved, we'll go to heaven. But receiving an inheritance, which is a word that is often used interchangeably, with reward is conditional. I'm on my way to heaven, but whether I get a reward is a conditional thing. <clears throat> I don't predicate my salvation on my works, only on my belief in Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? I'm saved because I believe on the Lord Jesus. He died for me. The very first thing he did is forgive my sins. This is why it's so important that we need to forgive. <clears throat> God condemns unforgiveness. He says, if you can't forgive, I can't forgive you. He says, if you don't forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. I'm going to tell you, in this life, people are going to sin against you. Have you ever found that out? People are going to hurt you. They're going to get hold of you. And you're going to need to learn how to release them and not judge them. Because thereby, by the grace of God, goes you and I. Self-righteous people, I, I, I've got to tell you, there's a stench about them. <clears throat> I remember, well, this, even today, even, even this year, there are people in churches who condemn others and look down their nose thinking they are more righteous than them. <laughs> 
I want to tell you, I'd check yourself out. Because when you've got that sort of an attitude, I don't believe you've got fellowship with God. I, I believe you're cutting yourself off from that fellowship. And you're thinking you're righteous. But that would be a terrible condition, wouldn't it? It's like waking up from a sleep. <laughs> you think you're okay, and then you wake up and realise you're not. Because unforgiveness is something that needs to be dealt with at the very root and the very base of our walk with God. <clears throat> Jesus is dead set against unforgiveness. He condemns it. There are three reasons why God hates an unforgiving spirit. Number one, it shows indifference to the greatest thing that God's ever done. He sent his son to die on a cross for your sins. To be forgiven is the most wonderful thing. In order to forgive us, God paid a severe price. You now only see the tip of the iceberg, but I believe when we get to heaven we're going to see what it costs God the Father to forgive us. To see his son hanging on a cross despised by men, beaten, whipped, died on a cross, one of the most cruel deaths where their lungs collapse. Nailed through the hands and feet. Can you imagine? I can't even begin to imagine the price the son paid for us. But how much more the father who was watching his son and knew that this was a penalty that had to be paid. Forgiveness has been bought by our Lord Jesus Christ. You've been redeemed and you can be redeemed from unforgiveness today. When we don't forgive, we actually interrupt God's purpose in this world. Reconciliation, the very first thing I was talking about. When you can't forgive, how can you ever go and speak to someone about God forgiving you? You might talk it, it might sound comes out of your mouth, but it'll be a hollow word, <clears throat> clanging bell, <laughs> and it certainly won't bring reconciliation. And the other thing is that God hates people who are in, have got ingratitude, who aren't thankful. God loves gratitude. He knows what he has forgiven us of. And he's fully aware of it, you know. His eyes on you, his eyes on the sparrow today. Whether your heart is forgiving or whether you have some things you need to deal with. Praise God. In Matthew 18, there's a servant who fell on his knees and he asked God to forgive him. He asked the king to forgive him. He said, be patient, I'll pay you back everything. He owed a debt that he couldn't pay. And the servant's master took pity on him and cancelled the debt and let him go. The master knew what he had forgiven the servant of, but then that particular servant went out, found one of his own servants who owed him 100 denarii, and he grabbed him and began to choke him. I think that's grabbing him by the throat, is it? <laughs> and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe then the servant did exactly what his master had done, fell on his knees, said, please forgive me, I'll pay you back. The one who had been forgiven refused and threw his servant into prison. Word got back to the one who originally forgave, who of course knew exactly what he'd forgiven that person of. And to think that there should be such ingratitude and anger, Jesus then added, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you, unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. From your heart. Say, from my heart. These are issues of the heart. <clears throat> when I was 65 years old, six years ago, on my birthday, my 65th birthday, I, um, I ended up with a tachycardia, rapid heart. And... Uh, told me it was a heart attack. They rushed me, Denise rushed me to the hospital here at Victor. 
poor old nurse was nervous as they wired me up onto their monitors. And my heart was over 230 beats. And it was jumping out of my chest. As a matter of fact, I tried to stop it by hanging onto it and stilling it. And I had my heart in my hand. I felt my heart in my hand bouncing out of my chest. It was a fearful time. But I asked the Lord, in the middle of it, I had the common sense to ask, why? Why is this happening to me? What do I need to deal with? Because I'm very aware that when I'm out of kilter with God, some, things can go wrong. The cover comes off me. It's a good word, that cover. We're talking about planting seeds at the moment and, and covering them with, with uh, mulch and things. Cover is a really good word. God covers you. Psalm 91, when you run into him, you're covered by God. You're protected by God. And he wants to protect you today. He wants you to be in the family, not have to worry, walk in perfect health. But we're a long way from that as God's people. So this causes me to always examine myself. I want to know what it is. I want to know what the problem is. What do I need to rectify? As much as I can possibly do, I need to rectify it doesn't affect my salvation, but it does affect my walk and my fellowship with God. If I've got any unforgiveness towards anyone, I can't speak to God. I get a brass ceiling. Well, I want to tell you, while I'm laying on that barouche or whatever it was at the hospital down there, and they're, they're hooking me up, trying to inject me with magnesium, I said, Lord, what's happening? And he said this to me. He said, forgive a pastor, and he gave me the pastor's name. I thought, oh my God, I didn't know I had found forgiveness for him. I just resented what he did. I resented what he did. We'd helped him, and he, he, uh, he bad-mouthed us for no reason. I was really ticked. I was ticked inside, but I let it go, and I'd forgotten about it. And the minute that the Lord spoke that to me, as quick as that, down came my heart rate. It came back to 80. From 230 to 80. The doctor's about to inject me, goes, hang on, what's happening here? He's looking at the monitor, and I'm looking at him, and I've got a smile on my face, and I said, it's all right, doc. It was a hard issue. <laughs> I had to forgive someone. I had to forgive someone and Jesus has just forgiven me. Praise God. I learned a huge lesson that day. It's not the first time that I've learned that lesson. Forgiveness has been an issue over the years. I remember, you know, this coronavirus. I remember a flu that hit this coast years ago and I think there was about 30 people on the coast died from that flu. There's, there's an age population down here, so you can expect that their mortality rates are a little higher than in Adelaide. <clears throat> and people were going down with this flu, some of them two or three times in a three-month period. And I remember the old prophet, Harold. I remember old Harold, come, how come you're not getting it? He got it once. He said, you know, you're going to get it the same as we all are. I said, no, you're not. no, I'm not. I said, God spoke to me. He told me to use Psalm 91 as my protection. And I would read Psalm 91 three times a day. And my family and me, we were covered. Well, I want to tell you, he got it twice. But he'd knock on my door to see if I was ill. And about the tail end of that flu, I remember, I just, just about thought we'd gotten through it. And someone told me about a man who'd spoken against me. And resentment came into my heart immediately. I wanted to go grab that man by the throat myself. <laughs> you know, I came out of that prayer meeting I was in where that man told me about the fellow who'd spoken against us. And I came out of that prayer meeting with a full-blown flu. Within minutes, I had a runny nose, headache, aches and pains middle of winter, and I had the flu. 
And I, then I realised what I'd done. I said, Lord, please forgive me, forgive me. And uh, no answer. No answer. I'd forgiven. No answer. You know what the Lord taught me? He taught me an incredible lesson. Three days later, I was instantly healed. Three days later. I had the three most miserable days of my life. I was stepping on nails. I was you, Everything that could possibly happen was happening <laughs> to me. I had old Harold knocking on my door to see if I was okay. <laughs> you all right? I said, yep. I wouldn't let him know I had the flu. I was standing upright and trying to breathe as best I could. <laughs> oh, miserable three days. And you know, I went to prayer on the Sunday night. It was pouring rain, middle of winter, sleep. It was a cold, cold bit of night. But I lifted my hands up. I went down the bluff and I lifted my hands up to God. And as I did that, the flu left. As I did that one thing, the flu left. I'd forgiven that man three days before but it took three days for me to be healed. And I said, Lord, how come it took so long? I thought, once you forgive, it's instantaneous. And he pointed me to Joshua. He said, sanctification is a three-day affair. Do you hear me? Sanctification, being set apart. He said, how long was I in the grave when I died on the cross? He said, three days. He said, yep. Sanctification. He said, I took on the sin of the world. A pure lamb. He was sanctified in three days. He rose from the dead. Full of power of God. And I'll never forget that lesson. He said, forgive. Forgive readily. Forgive easily. It's a lifelong thing. <clears throat> I'm not indifferent to what God's done for me. I'm so thankful that he sent his son and died. First thing he did was release forgiveness. I don't want to interrupt the work of God through my unforgiveness. Who am I hurting when I, un when I can't forgive? I'm hurting me, but I'm also hurting the person I can't forgive. I've got him in bondage just as much. And I'm not thankful for what God's done. And I want to be thankful because I've learned over the years that as I give thanks to God, healing flows. Healing not only flows to me, but it flows to the people that come in contact with me. Every time I give thanks, I'll just give you a little example of that. On one of our work sites, we had a cripple straighten up after coming for six months onto our work sites. I'll never forget that man. Crippled from birth, 37 years old, twisted like a crab. He walked like a, a crab. I can't even do what his body shape is like. One eye was down, one was up. One, he walked like this with his hand bent over, couldn't straighten it up about this level. Walked like a crab. And was always speaking about his, uh, what did he call it? Um, he, he called it, his in, not his infirmity, but he had a common word for it, meaning that he was okay, there was a word for it, so he was all right. <laughs> he didn't mind, he would just wear it. 37 years he wore this infirmity. 37 years he walked around like that. And um, disabled, Dis say disabled. Disability. Disabled, not able. So he's a disabled man, actually written poems about it, written books on it. But he came on our work sites looking for money from drink bottles so he could feed his cigarette habit. And when I said to him, I said, listen mate, I said, every time you come on this site here, I'll give you two bucks to go with those bottles. If you can just say, thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Gratitude to God. He burst out laughing. He said, I've been to church, that doesn't work. He said, but anyway, thank you, Jesus, for healing me. He put his hand out, <laughs> wanting the two dollars. He did that for six months. And then one day the Lord spoke to me. He said, not today. Today give him the real thing. Cast the unclean spirit out of him. 
Well, I want to tell you, we saw a miracle right before our very eyes on that work site. So did the concrete truck drivers. And I learned the value of thanking God and the value of getting the word of God into someone where it will explode like dynamite. How does forgiveness, unforgiveness manifest itself? Unforgiveness usually begins with resentment. You resentful towards someone? What, what's resentment? Simple words for resentment. Holding a grudge. <laughs> if you're holding a grudge against anybody, you better get rid of it. There's a word for someone here even now. Your arm will be healed when you forgive. Your arm will be healed, your shoulder will be healed when you forgive and release resentment and the grudge. Yeah, he's in the other room. <laughs> Amen. I, look, this is a word of knowledge. All I, can, all I can say to you is this word is for Christians today who still say they're okay and they're carrying resentment. There's a brass heaven between you and God being talking while well, that resentment's there. It's when you're inwardly bitter. You can put on a, a face and seem happy on the outside, but when you're bitter on the inside... There's no way you can look happy on the outside. Amen? You're preoccupied with hatred and self-pity. Oh, they're always picking on me. <laughs> self-pity is a shocker. Self-pity is one of those worst spirits. It's a door-opening spirit. It opens a door to everything else that's going to come and rob from you, steal and destroy from your life. Revenge is the Lord's, not yours. You know, when you resent someone, you want them exposed, you want them to be held up to the whole world to see what they've done to you. <clears throat> I've got to tell you, I could have done that many times. But I've also a perpetrator. I don't know how many people I've hurt in my life, <clears throat> but I don't want to become a stumbling block to the reconciliation that Jesus has won. Resentment leads to going over and over in your mind what they did. It's recounting, reliving exactly what's happened to you. Amen? All this leads to you want to get even, to get that revenge. Amen? You're determined to make them pay, not unlike the one who had been forgiven, but who still said, in effect, pay me back, pay me back, pay me back. That's exactly where you are. And the torment is that you're reliving the resentment. <laughs> you're handed to the, res to the tormentors. You keep reliving the resentment and it'll cause arthritis, it'll cause pains in your body, it'll cause all manner of problems. So just give it over, will you? How do you make them pay? One way is to say, I'll tell you what I know about you and then keep them paralysed with fear. Perhaps you know something about another and if you spilt the beans about them, it could ruin them. Unforgiveness is always tied to fear. What is it you're fearing? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. What is it that you're fearing? Do you know, God hates someone who holds anybody else to ransom with something that they know and causes those people to fear that it would be told. God forgives and he puts everything in the sea of forgetfulness once it's forgiven. So why would you want to keep bringing it up? <laughs> Some people think they're police officers. <laughs> that they are the ones that should bring it to right. That's self-righteousness. I want to tell you, that's one of the worst sins. God hates self-righteousness. He hates it with a passion. You're only righteous because he's made you righteous. No other reason. Through his son Jesus. There'll be a payday for those people who can't forgive. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father won't forgive you your sins. Matthew 6, 17. 
God intensely dislikes people holding another person to hostage or in fear. So just release people, will you? Forgiveness is a choice. Say so it's a choice. It's an act of your will. You will to forgive someone. It's not a feeling. My dad had cancer in his spine and right throughout his body. And the day he forgave something that happened to him during the war, he was instantly healed. He was given two months to live, but he was instantly healed by the simple act of forgiving. He made a choice. I'll never forget that day. My dad made that choice. He felt the peace of God and the unction of the Holy Spirit just come on him and he was set free. Forgiveness is a choice we have to make and it doesn't come easily. If it had been so easy, then why do you think Jesus mentioned it again after he finished the Lord's Prayer? He knows that it's not easy. It wasn't easy for God to do what he did, but God did it. He sacrificed his son and he asked us to make a little sacrifice by letting someone off the hook and even praying that God will let them off the hook. That's true forgiveness, isn't it? Amen. You forgive them and you're asking God, please forgive them, don't judge them. That's love. Forgiveness is the door and the road to love. And I've got to tell you, when you face the Father, the one thing he's going to ask each and every one of us is, did you learn to love? Did you learn to love while you're there on earth? And if you've forgiven people, you are well and truly on the road to love. You're not a edge of the river Christian. You're not an ankle deep Christian. You're in the water Christian. You're a Christian who's learnt how to forgive. Actually, I, I uh, was reading this morning a uh, hymn that John Newton, you know, the man who wrote Amazing Grace, wrote this hymn. In evil long I delight, I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight and stopped my wild career. He was a blackbirder. He was a man who would ship slaves over from Africa to the Americas. And he was a blackbirder and he found Christ on that boat and he turned and he wrote that song. It caused him to write that song, Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. Praise God for the forgiveness of God. Now I'm going to finish off by this. There are consequences of an unforgiveness spirit. Firstly, you grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you're sealed for the day of redemption. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 When the Holy Spirit is grieved, it means a distortion in one's thinking. Do you hear me? When he's grieved, it means your thinking is twisted. The Holy Spirit is grieved. It means a distortion in your thinking. I urge you not to grieve the Holy Spirit because your relationship with him is the best thing you've got going for you. The ungrieved spirit is what enables us to cope. I couldn't do my job if the Holy Spirit were permanently grieved. I thank God that I deal with my problems Short accounts. I can't function if my spirit is grieved. Can you? When your spirit's grieved, you're out of sorts. You feel miserable. You condemn yourself. Praise God. You become depressed, oppressed. You need to have peace in your spirit. If your spirit hasn't got peace, then I would question if I've grieved the Spirit of God and just say, sorry, Lord, forgive me. I forgive. Who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to forgive? Start there. That's where God started with you. 
Start there. Who do I need to forgive? And immediately you find, as you release people, peace and the anointing of God comes on you. Do you know, I was, I was sharing with Denise this morning, you know, the greater the things we have to forgive, they're probably harder to do, but the greater things that you have to forgive, because it's the people closest to you that'll hurt you most. How could you do that to me? The greater the overcoming the resentments towards them and forgiving them, the greater the anointing that comes upon your life. Do you hear me? The greater the anointing that will come upon your life. So treat it as an opportunity for more anointing. Amen? Treat it as an opportunity. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger. Ephesians 4. Brawling and slander along with every form of malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. <coughs> Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. The consequences of not forgiving someone, you end up being left to yourself. A refusal to forgive means that God slips away and lets you cope in your own strength. Not many people like that kind of life. Coping in your own strength. Doing it my way. I wonder where Frank Sinatra is these days. I did it my way. <laughs> Amen. The Bible says the backslider is filled with his own ways. Say the backslider is filled with his own ways. If you've got opinions that aren't godly, if you've got opinions that go against what God's truth says, you're going your own way. It's a backslidden position. In Proverbs 14, 14, it says, you're filled with your own ways. So when one's left to oneself and to the flesh, those unthinkable abilities towards sin might explode into your life. You might get in that place that John Newton was singing about. What was he saying? He was saying, in evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight and stopped my wild career. Don't get left to yourself. Not only does Satan get in, he'll take advantage of us if he can. He'll exploit the unforgiving spirit and he'll ride on top of it. And you could at times even manifest a demonic spirit, all because of bitterness that has preoccupied you. Not forgiving is an invitation to the devil to come in. Genesis 3, 4. When the devil said to Eve, you will not surely die? She said in effect, oh well, thank you for that, and believed it. And she ended up doing what she wanted to do and tasted the fruit. You shall not surely die, isn't that what Satan said to her? After Jesus told him not to taste of the tree. You don't want to grieve the Spirit of God firstly because you won't think clearly. Secondly, the devil comes in because God has left you to yourself. Oh, but people say, but he says you never leave me nor forsake me. No, you've removed, removed yourself from his presence with unforgiveness. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. So get, deal with it and start getting close again. Praise God. Praise God. You force God to become your enemy when you can't forgive. It causes fights and quarrels among you. What causes those fights and quarrels? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? 
You want something but you can't get it. You kill and covet but you can't have what you want. You quarrel and you fight and you don't have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may, not spend, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people don't know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You lose your anointing's potential. As a pastor, my anointing over my life has sometimes peaked and sometimes it's waned. And every time I examine when it's waned, I always find there's an unforgiveness issue involved there somewhere. And I don't have true, pure fellowship with the Father. That's the other, the other side of the coin. These, these are the things and the consequences of not forgiving. When we don't forgive, we end up living in a dream world. We end up believing we're okay and we're not. We end up believing we're okay. I remember I spoke this to a man years ago. I said, if you can't forgive, God can't forgive you. He said, oh, rubbish. He'd been a Christian for years. My God, that man had more unforgiveness issues than most people I know. And I just pray to God that he's actually dealt with these things today. But this message today for you, I want to lead you in a prayer where you will release people. Can we do that? Just follow me in this prayer if you believe the truth has been spoken today. Lord Jesus, I release. I'll just give you a few seconds to bring people to mind and set them before God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just release them right now from my bondage to judgment and I ask, Father, that you would release them also. And I ask you to forgive me. In Jesus' name. If you're listening to this program and you've never invited Christ into your life, and you need salvation, I'd like to lead you in that prayer that says, Lord Jesus, do this from your heart and you'll, you'll never be the same. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins as I forgive those who sin against me, Lord. Come into my life and take over, Father. I repent of my sins. Repentance is a prerequisite, which means you're turning around and go in the other direction. I repent, Father. Come into my life and take over. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and write my name in your book of life. I forgive everyone who's ever hurt me, Lord. And I thank you for my salvation in Jesus' name. I want to tell you, if you've prayed that prayer from your heart and you've forgiven someone this morning, healing now will start to flow into your body because of the price that Jesus paid for you. I, I see knees, I see shoulders being healed right now, elbows, wrists. Someone's got problems with the wrists here at the, the thumb, right at the bases of the thumb and at the wrists. They're being healed right now if you've been able to forgive those you've held in bondage. Father, I thank you for this today. Thank you. In Jesus' name. And all the saints said? Give it, give it. Praise God. Give it a give it. Yep, I think that's it. Sorry we can't have communion with you today. When you're having lunch, just remember who you're having lunch with. He's there. Say grace and thank him. Amen. And we'll have communion like that today, shall we? Oh, amen. God bless you. Wednesday night, 7.30, same, same channel. God bless you.